So this time, let's talk about focusing light through a lens, specifically a thin lens. But first, let's talk about what a lens is. If I have some object out here and I tell you that it's a lens, what does that actually mean? If I have a ray, if I have different rays coming into different positions on this lens, what it means to be a lens is whatever position you're at will translate to the output ray having a different angle. And the new angle it picks up is dependent on where the ray hit the lens. So essentially, for a lens, the input ray location determines the output ray angle. A lens does not have to be curved. It generally is made of different materials, but it doesn't really matter what it's made of. As long as it does this, as long as it takes the location of the ray and uses that to change the angle, then it is a lens. We're going to start at, oh, uh, and yes, <laughs> what is thin? Should probably explain that. It Thin, in this case, means that the input ray location is the same as the output ray location for the lens. It means that the lens itself is thin enough so that the ray doesn't really undergo any traveling distance so that the light bends inside the lens and changes the output location substantially. So for the next few exercises or lectures, we will assume this. And you might say, well, objects are actually thick and light does actually travel through them. So this approximation of saying the output ray is the same location as the input ray is probably not a good one. But it turns, and if you're going to say that, then you would call it a thick lens. But we won't do that for a while, and it turns out that you can still use the same calculations I will show you for thin lenses. For thick lenses, the only difference is that you have to include a fudge factor for thick lenses and just keep the math the same. And that's actually really easy to do, and since the math is much simpler that way, that's generally how it's done, and we will stick to that. So first we'll start with thin lenses meaning the input and output locations are the same. Let me go ahead and write that thin. In this case means the input and output ray locations are the same. And now let us deal with a better example of a true lens. In this case, we're going to use a convex curved lens made of glass. This is glass. Index 1.45. And we'll put it in air. And we're going to look at what happens to rays at different locations. And as you can probably guess, the angles will be different at different places. First, we're going to look at a ray that comes straight in from the center of the lens. And here, the glass looks flat to the ray. It's the same as drawing this situation where we're doing a Snell's Law problem where the input ray is coming in at an angle of zero straight into the glass. If you do Snell's Law, any ray coming in at an angle of zero will come out at an angle of zero or pass straight through. So that's what happens to this ray. This ray, however, has more of an angle to it because it's a ray that's higher up on, we'll call this the x-axis. So it has a higher x and let's take this situation and rotate it 
and I'll draw it over here. We're going to draw the glass interfaces flat again, but in this case, the ray is coming in at a steeper angle. And so, using Snell's Law, we'll find that it refracts something like that. If you then take this back over here, let me change the color of this ray so we're not so confused. Then this ray would come out something like this. So these are red as well. And you can see that the light eventually comes down something like this. And if you trace out all the different rays, they will refract at shallower angles closer to the center and steeper angles out at the edge of the lens so that they all focus to a point. And that's what we mean by focusing. So let's get on to the next part since we've covered this a few times at this point. What does it mean to image? Well, this right here is what we've defined as the focal length. Focal length. Essentially light coming in from infinity that has no angle but coming in at all possible locations, where does all the light get focused to and how far away is it from the lens being the focal length. Any lens has a focal length on both sides of it. They do not have to be equal. In this case, they would be. But they do not have to be. And let's put an object, we'll denote that with an arrow, right at this focal length. Well, what happens to all the light from that object hitting this lens? Well, it's just the reverse of what I just showed here. In this case, it's just the equivalent of light traveling from right to left instead of left to right. All the light comes out at a parallel. So we actually see that the lens is bending all the light and straightening it out or collimating it. This is what we call collimating when it turns light into a beam without an angle. But what happens, say, if we put the object closer than the focal length? We'll make a pink object that's closer. Well, this is a bit of a problem because now all the light comes in and this focal length determines or shows you what the focal power of the lens is and if an object is closer than the focal length then the light will not actually be able to bend enough for it to actually straighten the light or collimate it so actually in this case the light will be straightened out some but it won't be enough the light will still diverge. It's just instead of coming out at this beam angle, it will instead be coming out at a tighter angle. So generally, what this means is that you want to have an object either at the focal length, well generally you want it to be further away than the focal length because we want the light to actually converge somewhere over here. So to image an object you need to be further away than the focal length of the lens as we've just shown in these two circumstances and now let's show the actual imaging where we have two focal lengths and I have a new object that's going to be orange that is further away than the focal length of the lens. Now I'm going to show you a trick where you draw three rays. You only really need two of them in order to determine this object here where it will image on the other side. So first, let us draw a ray from the object through the focal length. I 
did a bad thing here. I didn't draw the lens to be large enough to actually encompass this ray. So let me extend the lens. This is actually a problem. If you don't have lenses that are large enough, they won't capture all the rays of an object, and the image on the other side will look dimmer. It won't be as bright. And that is a serious problem when trying to make lenses. Anyway, here we're able to make the lens as large as we want. This ray comes from the object straight through the focal point. And we can see from over here that light coming from a focal point comes out parallel on the other side. And we'll call that ray the focal ray. Second ray we're going to draw parallel from the object to the lens, which we know, conversely, on the other side, goes straight through the focal point on the other side. And that we'll call the parallel ray. You can see from this, probably, that we've already determined where the light is being focused by the lens. So this is where the image is and this is the object. There's actually a third ray that uh, takes a little bit of cheating to do, but this one goes straight through the center of the lens, like so, and actually passes through the same image point as one would expect, and this is called the chief ray. Now I said we're going to do a little bit of cheating. What does that mean? This ray is coming through the center of the lens, which we set up here when it comes through the center, the ray does not change in direction at all. But you can see here that there's an actual angle to it. So why doesn't the light bend or change coming out? The reason is that we've made a, a sleight of hand here, a little approximation we call the paraxial approximation, which we actually used last time. What this tells us is that we're assuming all angles in the system are less than 10 degrees, roughly less than 10 degrees. It just makes the math easier and it allows you to make approximations in the system like this one. Because this angle is so shallow, less than 10 degrees, we can make the approximation that the ray goes straight through the lens in the center without its angle being changed. Essentially the lens has no focal power at the center because it's flat. It's not very curved. You might say, well, paraxial doesn't seem very realistic. We have to image things at much higher angles many of the time, many other times. And you would be right, but just like with the thin and versus thick lens case, it turns out that if you use the apraxial approximation and then add on fudge factors later to account for wh however many angle ranges you want, that's the easiest way to go. Assume it's paraxial, solve it, and then add a fudge factor at the end. Because if you don't start with paraxial, the math gets very, very difficult. And you still get the same result at the end, just you have to work much harder for it. So I'm showing you the easiest way. Or this is how we're going to start, at least, with the paraxial approximation. We will get eventually get to non-paraxial. So there you go. And this system of drawing the three different types of rays to a lens and out of a lens doesn't work only for a single lens. What I've shown you is very powerful because it actually works for an entire system. If you can just draw a box around a system and say, here are my focal lengths and here is my object. What happens? Where is the image on the other side? And what does it look like? You can use these three rays to essentially tell me exactly what will happen to the object on the other side, or image, where the image will be on the other side. And the fact that you can use this 
virtually anywhere in ray tracing is very, very powerful. And it's very, very important that out of everything in this lecture that you take away, that I can draw a parallel ray, make it focus, draw a focal ray, make it parallel, and draw a center ray, or a chief ray. If you can do those three, you're good to go.